light manipulation these days is a little easier to achieve. And I think getting one little strip of, of a UV bar is doable. And some people are putting these into the lights. You're seeing more red diodes put into lights as well because it's another manipulation technique, so to speak. Some are saying you're getting more of these styles coming out of it and the esters coming out versus the blue spectrum. So it's utilizing light manipulation with each different genetic, though. It's not just your every genetic. You want to get more thiols? Just use this. Well, it has to have these traits in it. You know, it's like you may naturally be a fighter, but I need to be trained to be a good fighter. You know, I may have these genes to be tough or something. Don't get knocked out as easy. The brain and the water flow. But that doesn't mean you can fight. You need to be trained. So it's the same thing with plants. I feel like if you don't do the proper training and take care of them, adding this extra shit doesn't always guarantee it's going to work, you know, or get enough results to make it worthwhile. Good point. You mentioned that the UV li- UV lights. Uh, I think some people are using the reptile lights off like Amazon, real cheap, yeah, yeah. low wattage. So if you know you're unsure about things, just want to kind of test things out. Don't want really want to buy one of the, uh, you know, the name brand LED companies that are out there and spend because they're they're going to be more money than a small little UV reptile light off of Amazon, right? So just something else that you can potentially explore. Hundred percent. And I think that's the cool part about being you know a home farmer. I don't know why we're called home growers, a home farmer, Farmer. indoor farmer, is we're able to do this kind of cool shit and do your own test and figure it out. And if you have multiple tents and you could do a monocrop run on each, you could see if you're really getting these different results. I mean, there's a lot of people doing tests of side-by-sides on YouTube. That stuff's fascinating to me as a cannabis creator to still watch that kind of stuff because I don't always want to risk my garden. I want to have the end product. And if I'm going to grow these plants, I don't always want to do this extra stuff. I have a process that works really well. You know, the one thing I would say is like with air or wind manipulation, and this could be wind and even humidity and temperature swing manipulation all utilized together at once in terms of getting more trichome production or strength on your stems. So they, they they're girthier. Yeah, this is a good one. This one, I don't think it's studied that much. So there's a lot of anecdotal stuff behind it. Me in particular, I can speak to it anecdotally is, uh, the wind stress, I could visibly see more trichomes on the plant. Now, I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, you know, on a four by four grow tent, for example, I usually have a, a clip on fan that's on one side, another clip on fan that's on the other side, right? So, the plants that are closest to those fans, those oscillating fans that are kind of blasting onto the plant, not too crazy, but it's, it's a lot closer than the plants that are in the back of the tent. Yeah. Well, physically, we're looking at the plant, you know, mid flowering, I see a clear difference. The front plants that are right next to the fan, are low to a trichomes and there's not as many trichomes on those plants in the back that aren't getting that direct wind blasting on them. So yeah, I mean, I'll speak to it anecdotally. But that still, it, like it, what, know, for me. what fan companies like AC infinity makes everything. So they're not just air. What fan company, maybe Hydrofarm or not Hydrofarm, uh, um, hurricane fans. Oh, the original. Uh, yeah. Remember those hard, those were beasts. Yeah. Maybe a brand like that, you know, I, I don't see anybody doing testing. The only people who are doing the testing are the ones who financially benefit from it. That's the tough part, yeah. you know, because it's expensive for a lot of this. And we don't trust anyone unless you're a scientist. You can't just do it at home because you're nobody. You're some dumbass. <laughs> Even if you have videos that show side by side, yeah. I don't trust you. Mother Nature has been training our plants for a very <laughs> long time. This is true. You know, it's when we're talking about wind stress, if you go out and you see, see our plant in the field, it's kind of clear that the ones that have to deal with wind are a little bit hardier, they're a little bit stronger, they're a little bit more well, well-rounded, and that's simply because they had to build up resistance to that continuous pressure being pushed on them constantly. Yeah. Or they would have just, bonk, fell over. But no, they don't. They get pushed, they become a little more resilient. They get pushed, they get a little bit thicker. And that this is, just, I, don't, I don't think that's anecdotal at all, to be honest with you. I think that's pretty well It's just well the fact seen. that we don't have a scientific white paper to put yeah. with it. But it's like, dude, everybody who's anybody who's grown can, can attest for this. And I think this is where that fine line between too far becomes a thing because you get wind damage is the thing you yeah, can see yeah. with leaves. Yeah. So it's like. It dries out. Or yeah, the yeah. And, you've had, and I've had buds before where it's like the trichomes are gone. I'm like, what the fuck happened? It's like. <laughs> It's like it fried it or it something. Blew them off. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Do I win the trichomes yeah. blowing off? The it's like my terps and trichomes are <laughs> gone. But it's like uh, in those cases, it's a lot of time is is that direct oscillating fan hitting it for a little bit and moving and not being yeah. right on there. Going right. back and yeah. tapping it. And it's, it's that light stress. It's the it's, it's a, a low break. stress it's technique. I hate the LSTs called that low stress training. It's, low stress training is a form of training. If people aren't sure of it, low stress it's training is a tying distraction. it down. 
It is for the Epstein files. Yep. yep. I knew yeah. it the whole time, dude. But I knew it the whole time. The weirdest part of that is you no think about thing. it is there's techniques that are low stress techniques, but then yeah. there's low stress training. Yep. So then it throws you off when you're talking about LST. And mm-hmm. I think that some of these techniques are lower stress in terms of like, you're not going to damage your plant as much. And other ones like wind potentially can be higher stress. So you got to dial that in pretty well. You can literally bre- like bend a branch so much you break it. Especially if you have a big heavy cola. If that wind is too consistent, it's gonna wobble and drop. So it's finding that that fine line between it and making sure you have a nice, even, consistent blow on the plant. But it's it's hard if you got a big bunch in a room. You're gonna just get those front ones that are closest because it's blocking all of the air to the other plants. Stick a fan on the floor. Yep. Stick one in the middle of the tent facing up. There's there's some good ways to move that air, keep that get no stagnant areas. You know, back to the nature kind of training our plants. Nature's done this in regards to drought. Some of the best products, some of the best plants we have come from the Middle East. Not That's a lot true. of rain out there. Dry as hell. And it's some good stuff. And it would, it would lead me to believe that, you know, maybe drought, drybacks, the technique that could be used to kind of increase your trichome production because it's another level of stress that the plant has to rebound from and by rebounding it, it's going to create a, in heighten or enhance its its defenses so yeah drought stress another thing that's been done by nature wind stress it, i think it's a valid techniques indoor and outdoor yeah and the drought stress is another one of those that you can take too far in a sense right it's like easy to take far is just like wind stress Dude, you can take yeah, too, you guys a little saw bit my too garden. far you saw my plant this morning it just droops down just, and sh- if it dries out entirely i mean there's sometimes it there's no rebounding Dude, if you're letting it dry back fry. like it looks like literally a, uh, it's been sat outside in the sun cooked it sometimes dude and then if you're yeah. in organic soil goodbye to your microbes yeah like they need that moisture you go too far on a dry yeah. back especially organic soil you're killing all of the extra efforts that you just put in. All the life in there just has been dehydrated. So it's like there's the fine line of not going too far with drybacks. But if you do get that good, like a 30%-ish ballpark dryback, and that's you need some sort of meters to measure, you know, moisture meters, obviously, in this case. We're not just eyeballing and lifting it. But in the, you can really see some massive yield differences, dude. Like maybe not your cannabinoids, but holy shit, have I seen like, 50 60 70 percent increases on yields where it seemed like i'm like would you is pgrs <laughs> how did you get this but it's a technique of making those roots expand and grow like crazy and really work for the food and the water as they're getting just enough a drip feed just enough to give them the strength to keep going and that can be beneficial some genetics take better than others i've noticed some it seems like we're sacrificing cannabinoids and giving more biomass which I don't want that, but it depends on what your goal is, obviously. Yeah, I was going to say you could go any level uh, of depth when it comes to drought stress with the moisture meters. You can kind of measure. You could be a home grower and just say, hey, you know what? I'm just not going to water for an extra day. And then slowly, you know, just a light uh, drought stress, light dry back, nothing too extreme. Or you can take a meter to it, have a meter in your medium, and then you can really get precise, uh, real precise, as long as you, of course, um, depends on what type of uh, meter you're using, the moisture meter you're using, there's different kinds, but, um, if you're using like the eco wit one where there's like a percentage, uh, yeah, first of course, learn what percentage the plants thrive in for that particular medium. If you've got something that's more peat based versus something that's more cocoa based, well, you're not going to be able to hold as much. Mo- well, the percentage will be lower in a more peat based medium because if you have too high of moisture in there, you just drown the plant, you, the, the oxygen. Yeah. Um, and you'll see a higher percentage of water kind of being there if it's like a cocoa or something that's uh, heavier in cocoa. It could be a cocoa meat, a like cocoa a hydro peat style. mix. Like bio flour, for example, is a great one. Um, lots of variation on that one. And I can get like uh, with my eco moisture meter in between 40 and 50% is what that reads one time. And the plants are really happy. Uh, but I put that in Fox or Motion Forest soil and if they hit 30%, they're struggling. It's just, it's too much. So there's a big difference there. Definitely want to learn your medium um, and how that kind of measures out before you start playing around with this drought stress. So you can, you kind of have an idea, okay, if I'm looking at this percentage, how far down can I go before I know that, hey, this is enough drought. This is enough stress that I haven't, I haven't given it. Now I'm going to add in water, you know, so. That's where people want to do rock wool. 
Coco and all these medias that they can go real heavy with it. And it makes sense when you're thinking in a commercial setting or in a high production setting, cash crop, whatever. You can't be as uh, rigid when you're dealing with stuff like that. You have more flexibility. But when you're dealing with, again, our traditional kind of home grow soils, Fox Farm being one of the leading ones, Ocean Forest, it's not as forgiving for that. It's, it's known for hand watering. It's almost designed for our traditional way of growing. These other ways are high frequency fertigation with, with the pushing and pushing and pushing the genetics. So they're meant to be able to be the soilless medias. That's why people say it's just like hydro. You know, if you're doing it right, it's not deep water culture, but it's, you can push it, man. That plant can kind of sit in water and do really well. It's just one of those factors where you go too far with it and you're, you're, killing that plant off the potential that it has you could literally kill the plant but you're killing off the potential so sometimes that dryback is like if you don't have the technology to dial it in with you know again some sort of moisture meter you, i wouldn't even do it i'd stay away from it honestly i see people trying to do it because they hear the word dryback and crop steering and they're like dude i'm just i didn't feed for three days it drooped i'm like brother you're an organic soil you need to stop doing that don't just read a few things and get shiny object syndrome the, the pushing of your plants and having these stress, these stress techniques are really cool and, and fine and dandy to do, but sometimes you can just leave it alone and get good results. These are that next level, intermediate. You've already grown it. You've seen the morphology. You've done some things. Now let's, let's try some shit, some experiments, and see what we can get, you know? This FTS clip was brought to you by AC Infinity, leaders in garden innovation. Use discount code THESTASH15 at checkout to save some money on your order. From the Stash Podcast.